A few weeks ago, I decided to build my own hollow chess game. I wanted to recreate what I'd seen in Star Wars and then show that at Game Dev Guild and even do a quick demo of it at GDC. The end goal is to put it onto my Tilt 5, have the board pop up right here on this table, and have my monsters fighting and be able to play with another player. After the decorating was done, I searched around and found a copy of the Star Wars hollow chess board and I was able to pull that into my game and it worked pretty good. I was able to set up some basic character movement with some capsules and once those were working it was time to set up actual characters and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to show one way that you can set up characters in your own games that I think is pretty easy to do and very reusable. I searched initially for character models that matched the board game. If you look online, there are 12 different characters, all with weird unpronounceable names, and they've all got these interesting looking alien models. Now I could find some versions of those alien models, but none that were animated or really made for games. So instead of using those, I decided to hop onto the asset store and find some of the best assets that I could that kind of matched the theme. The Proto Factor sci-fi series seemed like a good fit and I already had it. I think it's on sale in one of the lightning deals right now by the way. Once I decided on some models I opened up my monster prefab and this is what it looked like. Just a simple capsule with a cube on it as an indicator for targeting and a canvas that showed me how much health I had on each one. So I wanted to add my character models and the easiest way to do this was to go into my proto factor folder, go find the prefabs for each of the different aliens or monsters and then drag them all down to be children. I did have to adjust the scale on them to about a 0.2 because a lot of them were just giant bosses and I needed to scale them down. And in the end, it looked like this. Here you can see I've got a monster that has a whole bunch of different children monsters on it. And if you look over here in my inspector, I've got some basic settings that cover the four stats I needed, health damage, attack range, and move range, and a slider to adjust which model I'm showing. Now with just that, I'm able to have all of my monsters visually show up, select them, and even place them on the board and have them animate, which is what I wanna talk about next. But first, let's take a look at the code for this monster. In the monster, you can see I've got an on validate that's just setting the monster to be active or the child model to be active if the model index matches our model index, which is what that slider is set up to. If I hit F12 and go to the slider, you see that it's using a range, but here it's using an Odin specific range so that it can dynamically give me a maximum value reading the models count minus one. So this way I don't have to go in and update the code. I don't have to type it in. I can just have a slider that goes from the minimum to the maximum number of possible characters. You can see it as I slide it across here. If I remove something, my maximum value will go down to a 13. There you go. You see it changed automatically. Speaking of Odin, Serenix is this video sponsor. Personally, I use Odin Inspector on almost all of my projects. Odin's a really powerful, user-friendly editor extension that instantly speeds up your workflow without having to write a single line of code. It includes over 100 attributes right out of the box that you can fully customize to meet your needs in whatever project you're working on. I recently had the chance to collaborate on a detailed video with Serenix showing some of the most powerful features in Odin Inspector. It featured some of my favorite attributes that have saved me a ton of time and really helped me speed up development. So I definitely recommend you go check out Odin Inspector and go watch the video to speed up your development workflow. I'll make sure that the links for both are in the description. After getting the character swapping set up, I needed to set up animations. The default animator for all of these characters just plays through every single single animation and I really just needed four. I need to be able to place a character down, have them do a basic idle, and then I need to have them be able to do a walk and then an attack and maybe take a hit and maybe even die. So I guess there are five animations. You can see I've set up four of them here and I've got them set up for this one character. Here, if we press play, you can watch him animate. I can click and choose a position. He'll run over to it and then I can even click and have him play an attack and the thing taking a hit will take a hit. So how are these animations set up? Well, if you look here, I've got the character that just attacked selected and he's got his second character model selected as the one that's enabled. If I go look at the model again, or the main object, you see it's model index one. 
which is that second one in the list. And then it's got an animator controller on it. But watch when I double click the animator controller. It's not an actual animator controller. In fact, it's an animator override controller. And that's the thing that I wanted to show here. When you set up an animator controller, which I've done here on the other character, you can actually override that. Let's take a look at the first character, this big guy that's taking some hits here double click on him. His animator is this animator named Monster, the one that you saw here. It's got a couple parameters for whether he should show his walking animation, show his attack animation on the trigger, there we go, or show a take hit animation. Now I didn't want to recreate that for every single one of the enemies, so instead what we do is stop playing, right click, and create a new animation override controller. So I right click, and I choose animation override controller, which is somewhere down here. And then we want to give it the name of our next one, which is what's this, like gobbler? Let's put in gobbler. And then we'll choose the animator over to override. So you hit that controller button and I just go search for my monster, that core one that I'm gonna use for everything. And then here you can see all of the animations that I can override. I can scroll down and find the gobbler folder, go find the FBX file for it, and then find things like my get hit front drag that into my hit right here, and I can drag in the rest of them for my other animations. Once that's done, the gobbler will work. Of course, I will need to add my animator override controller to the gobbler object inside of my monster prefab. And go press play, show you that it works, and then I wanna talk a little bit about some of the downsides to building your setup this way. And here, let's grab the gobbler. So while it works perfectly fine, there are some serious performance issues. There we go, look at that, our gobbler's walking around. There are some things that you need to think about when you're building out this way, because one of the biggest issues is that all of my models or all of my characters, my monsters here, are now loading a copy of this model here. It's not a huge performance problem right now because I have a scope of exactly 12 monsters and it's never gonna grow beyond that. I don't really have to worry about it too much, but if I've got a ton of monsters, then we're gonna wanna do something a little bit more dynamic. And in that case, I would recommend going with something like a scriptable object that defines which model you should use and then dynamically spawning that model at runtime. That way you don't end up with extra memory usage and extra over kind of heavyweight objects that you don't necessarily need. But if you don't have that scenario, you can just build a game and your performance is gonna be just fine with your setup like this as long as your objects are disabled, then you're good to go with something simple like this. And that's what I would recommend starting with and then building upon that. Now, if you've got some ideas, recommendations for other ways to build character systems and character setups, please drop a comment down below. There are a lot of different things you can do, a lot of really cool advanced setups that you can do and a lot of very simple things. I wanted to show one of the simpler ones, but show a couple of the more advanced things that you can do with it, like the animator override. So again, if that was helpful, tap that thumbs up button, subscribe. And also don't forget to check out Odin Inspector. I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite tools, and it's the one thing that I pull into just about every Unity project. All right, see you in the next video. Bye.